amazing uh, week we had this past week. Um, thank you for all of you who helped serve, who helped be a part of this week. Uh, we've spent months getting ready for this last week uh, that's taking place in Life for a Church. Some of you got to be a part, some of you didn't, and I want to encourage you next year uh, that you will be a part because we actually we need you. We need a lot of you. Uh, the event continues to grow. Um, we reach out to other community folks to help us along the way, but we want our folks to be on the front lines helping and serving and giving. Um, not only do we do that event, we, we think about 1,500 people were here in our building, maybe even more than that. It was kind of lost count at some point with the number of folks that came through. Uh, but it was an incredible day. Not only that, then we served uh, the new teachers and staff in our district. 75 folks were here on Wednesday. And then we turned around after that and they got all the floors waxed, emptied all those rooms out. And after we did that, then Friday morning, we served our Pedal Primary School family 130 lunch. Uh, and so you might not be a part of those, but as a church family, you were a part of those. Because as you give, you let us engage people with the hope of the gospel to see lives transformed. That's our goal. That's our hope. That's our prayer. And that's why we do the things that we do this week. And it's been a tiring week, it's been a long, but it's been a good week. We've touched the lives of a lot of people uh, in this community. And they know that our community cares and that Pedal First Baptist genuinely cares. Not just with our mouth, but with our actions. And so the Bible reminds us in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25, where Jesus talks about it and is telling his disciples... Um, did you go and visit anyone in prison? Did you give anybody clothes? Did you feed anyone? Did you give anybody a cup of cold water? And they were like, Lord, well, we're not sure we did these things. He said, when you did any of those things, and you did them, you did them unto me. And so our prayer and our hope and our, 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 our goal was that we would uh, share with the least of these, that we would share unto Christ. And so thank you, church family, for being a part of that. And uh, there's more pictures we'll put up later on our social media, on Facebook. Uh, you can check that out and see. But it was a great, great week. So thank you. Our coordinators did an amazing job. Whitney and Kristen uh, did a great job. Um, sadly, poor Whitney and Bobby are in the hospital with Kaylin. She's in the hospital, had a, uh, got dehydrated from a stomach bug, so they're not able to be here this morning. But thankful for all those folks who helped coordinate and make that happen as well. One other thing that's uh, the second floor, in the middle of all that, we were finishing the second floor, and a lot of folks make uh, things happen around this church. I would love to recognize everybody that's a part of what's done, but um, there's one guy in particular that works behind the scenes, and um, he would die. But Andy Simmons um, has just been a blessing in me. We don't hire a general contractor to make all these projects happen. Um, but obviously, if you know anything about me, my skill set to general contract anything is frighteningly horrible. And I don't know anything other than just to say, hang on, let me call Andy, I'll ask him. And so if you can imagine the preacher calling you 6 or 12 or 18 times during a week, some weeks, um, and interrupting your job, what a blessing that would be. Wouldn't that bless you? Wouldn't you love to hear the voice of the pastor? And not, half the times it's an emergency because this broker, that broker, this isn't working. Um, and, but I just, Andy, I just want to say publicly, I know you don't do it for this reason, and I know you'd be mad at me for doing it, but um, this, the, the building that we've added, these spaces would not happen without a lot of volunteers. Uh, people like Mike Emmon that put in hours uh, late in the night and other folks that do a lot to help this happen. But Andy really helps take the lead in that and our building and grounds. And Andy, I just thank you from the bottom of my heart because we couldn't have these spaces without you. Or if we did, it would cost us a heck of a lot more money than what we have. And so thank you, Andy, for serving um, our church. I appreciate you. Um, students, what did you think about your space this morning? It's pretty cool, huh? Car carpet and stuff. Preschool, just wait till you're down there volunteering. You'll hear them upstairs. Don't worry. That's going to be a sweet room up there. It's going to be uh, loud speakers and uh, lights and all kind of cool stuff. And so we're rejoicing. Uh, look forward to August the 14th and them kicking off in their space. Um, still got a couple things to do, stage and sound booth and some lights to come in. But other than that, we are uh, well on the way. Well, if you have a copy of God's Word, would you turn to Ephesians chapter 5? Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse number 15. I told my wife yesterday, I said, I just got to tell you, I am so glad this message series is over. <laughs> um, Y'all are supposed to laugh. That was funny. But anyway, um, yeah, I know you've enjoyed it, and I have certainly learned a lot. I've been challenged. But I just want to tell you, man, normal sermons are, are challenging to put together for me, uh, just in my learning level and dyslexia and all things that I work through to try to get a message together. But I'm going to tell you, this series has really challenged me in some new and fresh ways to try to bring truths of the Word of God to some of these issues that we are facing in our culture in an ever more present fashion, maybe that it seems in a very long time. So I'm excited from that standpoint just to take a breath and, and get into something maybe a little bit more quote-unquote regular. We're going to talk about the family, uh, which will be a great series. I've not done one on the family in quite some time. And several of you asked me last year, Pastor, can you really love you? You do a family series. Uh, one husband was bold enough. He's not here today, so I can talk about it. <laughs> I can, uh, yeah. can, can I say his name? Is that okay? Are you okay with that? Okay. So Jason Walter says, listen, you need to do that message series. And because I need you, my wife missed that message series. She needs to hear that. 
I'm like, you're bold, you're brave. Just going to say I'll let you hear the other part later. So anyway, poor Kayla. Anyway, uh, we're going to share that series together over five or six weeks. We were originally going to launch um, a thing called Momentum uh, this fall in September. Uh, this is going to take all of our life groups through financial peace. If you know anything about Dave Ramsey, we're going to talk about financial peace, but we're going to push that back to January after we talked with some folks there uh, with Momentum. They encouraged us. We needed a little bit longer of a ramp up time than what we were preparing for. And so we're going to push that back to January. We're going to do some other things in the fall, um, but just hang tight about it. Some of you, I know we're really excited about that and uh, I'm excited about it, but we'll, we'll, we'll push it back to January. So just hang tight to that. Well, we want to finish our seventh series and talk about perhaps maybe another hot button another issue that we don't necessarily talk about in church, but talking about social media, technology, television, uh, the internet, all the things that have become a very common place in our lives, in our everyday lives. I remember going back in high school, there was no such thing, and some of you remember these days, there was no such thing as the internet, there was no such thing as email. We certainly would have laughed at the idea of an electronic device like this that would have housed, and you could actually talk to somebody on the other side of the world. That was only for satellite television and NBC or ABC or CBS News, and even then there was like a, you know, an eight-second delay from the time they talked to them, and the time it bounced off the satellite to get back to hear what you were saying. And now we are interconnected in ways we never even fathomed or imagined. And really, quite frankly, technology has gotten so far ahead of us that we are in our society and culture and government, we are regularly trying to catch up. Much less in the church sometimes, we are way behind the eight ball of trying to to address some of these particular issues, in particular social media. And unless we think this is an American culture thing, on my last trip uh, in, in April to Southeast Asia, Um, phones are everywhere. I mean, they're a commonplace thing. And in in undeveloped and third world countries, uh, they have cell phones in in the same rate we do. In fact, maybe even more because they don't have landlines. And so it's much cheaper to build cell towers than it was to go and put in landlines. And so everybody has technology. Uh, Data over there is a lot cheaper than it is here. And so as I'm talking with our translator, he starts naming these speakers. He said, have you heard of this guy? Have you heard of this guy? And I'm like, no, where are they from? He said, America. And I'm like... I've never heard of them. He's like, man, this speaker, I've heard of this conference and that conference. And I mean, he was telling, I learned more from him than I even knew myself. And how, he knew all this off of one thing, off of YouTube, all right? He had YouTube. And the, everywhere you went, people had phones, right? Everywhere you go. So it's not just an American thing. It is a worldwide phenomenon. And in fact, in some places of the world, people spend more time on electronic devices than actually we do even in America. Now, let's be clear. There are some really great things about digital and social media. There's some great things, some great tools, but there's also a lot of bad that's out there. I'm not here today to bash social media. Students, I'm not here to bash your use because I'm going to bash your parents as well. So just hang tight um, because we think that it's all of a teenager thing. Statistics prove otherwise. And if I ask your teenager, and sometimes your teenager might have said to you, well, you always have your phone in your hand too. Um, When you try to tell them to get their phone down, you know, that really ticks you off. Then you realize, you know, they're probably right. Um, And so we want to talk about this issue and have a conversation, right? It's not to condemn anyone, but I want us to be honest and take a hard look at where we are. Now, some of you are thinking to yourself, Brad, what sermon and text of the Bible are you going to use? Dr. Dan's with me today. What are you going to use to talk about social media? Because Lord knows social media did not exist in the day of Moses, right? There's no way. And so what do we use? What I want you to see about the Word of God, this is what sometimes we miss. And that is this, is that sometimes when the Bible doesn't address a specific issue, like social media that didn't exist then, obviously, or the web or the internet, what do we do? We go find principles, timeless principles that line up with where we are today. It's amazing, it's extraordinary that we see the Word of God speak into exactly what we're going to talk about today in our lives. In Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse number 15, let me invite you, if you will, to stand the reading of God's Word. Um, I've gotten out of the habit of that, and I'm I'm sorry that. Let's stand together, everybody across the building, and I want to get back in the habit of doing that because God's Word is worthy of us recognizing it this morning. Chapter 5, beginning in verse number 15. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation or drunkenness, but be filled with the Spirit. Father, I pray with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength that you would speak through our hearts this morning. As we open your word, as we allow it to fill our hearts and our lives, as we allow it to uh, take root in our lives, as we allow it to 
to challenge us, to convict us, to transform us. God, thank you that it's not here to condemn us. But Father, point us to the Savior. Point us to the truth of the Word of God. And Lord, this is a a subject that has taken over our culture in so many ways. And so Lord, I pray that we would see your Word speaks into this. And God, we would make adjustments in our lives that we need to make that will be pleasing and honoring to you. God, would you help me to communicate these words in a timely fashion, Lord, in a way that people will hear it and understand it. God, help me to speak slowly. Help me to speak the words that you would have me to speak so that we could hear and respond to your message. We pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, let me ask you a question. Out the gate, I asked you to do an experiment with me last week, and that was to keep up with what time you spent on social media and or on your phone, right? Now, I'm sure all of you did that. You brought in your journal and you kept a log, right? Did anybody do that this week just for fun to make me think that anybody listened to what I said? Anybody just raise your hand and just actually did it? There's one I see. That's good. Two. You did it this week? Okay. Three, four. You did it today, though. You did it last Sunday, but you forgot the rest of the week. Well, good. That makes you probably a typical church member. That, you fit right in. That's good. You did it on Sunday, but you forgot after that. That's very good. So you fit right in. You're in the norm, right? Anybody? All right. So I want, how many of you would just, so you have to guesstimate, okay? I, just want, you, I want you to do this poll. We're not going to condemn anybody. We're not looking around and taking notes of who's raising their hand. But I just want us to see together. How many of you know for certain that perhaps every day this week, you spend at least an hour on this device? At least an hour every day. Raise your hand. Okay? All right. Keep them up. Don't, don't put them down. This is good. This is, this, is little, this is training for Pentecostal right here, okay? This is Church of God right here, all right? All right. Secondly, how many of you spend at least two hours a week? Raise your, keep your hand up. Spend at least two hours a day on the phone, okay? Be honest. Don't lie. God knows, okay? God knows. All right, how many spend at least three hours a day on this device? Okay? This is good. I love this murmuring underneath. Okay? How many more? Four, four more hours. Okay, we still got hands up. Thank y'all for being honest. Five or more hours. Okay, six, one more hours. Okay, the rest of you, we're going to alter the altar right now. And uh, no, I'm kidding. All right, so um, lots of hours, right? Okay, I want you to see. Now, now here's another question. You ready for this one? Now, look, this is going to be a zinger. You're going to be so glad you came to church. I'm telling you, all right? Now, how many of you spend at least an hour reading God's word every day this week? Raise your hand. Yes, good. And ouch. Oh, good. One. Okay. Now, I could take it down to 30 minutes. How many of us even read our Bible every day? You don't have to answer this because that might get a little personal. We're good about the phone, but the Bible reading might be a little difficult, right? How many of us spent time reading God's Word every day this week? Right? Raise your hand. Look, see? Cross the bell. That's good. Beautiful. That encourages your preacher's heart. Praise the Lord. All right? That's a challenge to us, isn't it? Right? Sometimes we get our time really, really mixed up. It gets out of whack. It gets out of kilter. We need to have some times to readjust how we spend our time, right? Now, on social media, I didn't know anything about this until last year, but there's, there's things called a streak, okay? How, how many of you got a streak going? Raise your hand. Okay, good. Oh, watch this now. Raise your hand high. Okay, how, all right, teenagers, put your hands down. How many adults have a streak? You know what more than what I'm even talking about. Any adults got a streak? I got one. I got one. I'm pretty proud of mine. I'm pumped about mine. Raise your hands. Good, 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 good. All right, say mine, mine right now is, uh, what is it, 300 and something days. I forgot. I looked at it this morning. On time hop. I keep up my time hop because I want to look what happened last year and, and be happy or sad, whichever what happened, right? It's a streak, right? With people, all right, teenagers, raise your hand. How many got a streak going? Raise your hand. Raise your hand high. Come on, come on, be bold. How many of you have a streak that goes over 500 days? Anybody got one that goes over 500 days? Okay, good. Wow, this is exciting. Christy Lent, look at there. She's a happening adult right there. That's good. Sorry, I called you out. Sorry, that's good. You checked yours. You got your phone right there to check it. That's good. All right, somebody else. Uh, over 600 days. Got, got over 600 days. Keep your hands up. 700 days? 800 days? Wow. Miss Vion, you get a prize today. We're going to give you one free peppermint today. Well done, well done, right? Got a streak over that long, right? It's a streak. Now, here's another challenge. How many of us have a streak of reading God's Word consecutively or being in worship in life groups every Sunday? Or even more, a streak of serving God by serving in the local church inside or outside the walls, right? That's a good spiritual Bible I have to have. See, there's good things. See, there's good things about that, right? There's good things about technology because you can read the Bible in all kinds of translations. You can use it wherever you go, right? So here's what I want us to see this morning, right? The reality is what we often say is, often what? I am too, right? 
I have again yet to meet a person that's ever come off and needed counseling because they're just bored. I've just never had anybody say, Preacher, you've got to help me out. I just have too much time on my hands. I don't know what to do. Rarity, I don't think I've ever had that happen. I've had people tell me they have extra time. Maybe when you get into retirement years, perhaps that may feel that way sometimes. But by and large, nobody ever says that, right? But here's the reality. We all have the same 24 hours, seven days a week. We all have the same amount of time. But the question is, what do we do with that time? I want us to look and see about some realities about statistics that may blow your mind. They certainly blew my mind this morning. You can look on the screen here on the outline here. Let's talk about this. Um, the first one is this, and I'm going to skip past that next one. Digital and social media are changing our culture and the world for adults, for teenagers, uh, for preteens even, right? It's changing our culture, and it's changing it rapidly, right? Let's skip ahead, if you will, Michael. Let's go ahead and jump to the second one. For the first time in 2019, the average time spent on digital media surpassed the time spent watching television for the average person in America. Three hours and 43 minutes spent on this kind of device, okay? Notice the next one. Children and students spend an average of five or more hours a day, and it proven, I just watched what I just did, the, the, the average probably bore out in our room, spend an average of five or more hours every day on one, on, every day on, that should be, some type of electronic device, including computers. Now, some of the stuff might be five hours more because you're required to do some stuff at school, all right? Let's keep going. The average amount of daily time spent on social media among Americans now is two hours and 22 minutes a day. The highest rate, not surprisingly, among the ages of 16 to 24, that's been an average a day, a day, three hours and two minutes, okay? 81% of, all right, so get this one now, eight adults now, so we're going to blast the teenagers. 81% of adults report going online at least once a day, with 30% of that saying they are online almost constantly all day long. 48% of those ages 18 to 29 say they're online almost constantly throughout the day. That's a high percentage. 92% of teenagers report going online at least once or more a day, and 24% say they're online almost constantly. So notice, students are online a lot, but notice so are adults in pretty big numbers. 70% of teenagers reported using social media multiple times per day, and 16% say it's almost constantly. So it's a lower number. Adults, look at this one. <laughs> 70% of adults have Facebook, right? And 74% of those who had it reported checking it every single day. Okay? Let's just see how that works in our congregation. How many of you got Facebook? Raise your hand. Teenagers and adults alike. Raise your hand. Okay, that's a lot of people. All right? That's 75% for sure. All right, let's check and see. In a Barnum survey, 48% of those uh, report their preteens. That should be T-H-E-I-R. I love enough to catch my typos. Preteens have a smartphone. Preteens, that is 12 and below, already have a smartphone. Okay, 88% of teenagers have a smartphone. Here's the kicker. From 2012, the year I came to Pedal First Baptist, and 2019, in seven years, that has increased 41% of teenagers who had cell phones. For a, for a teenager to hold in their hand an $800 device in 2012, to the vast majority of us, we would have said, there's not a chance that's happening. I said it. I said it loud and proud, and I ate it. And so did a lot of you, didn't you? I'm never going to let my child, my parents would have no more let me touch an $800 device. We couldn't touch the television unless our dad told us we could. And that was just to change the channels because he didn't want to get up and change them, right? And now our children are walking around with an $800,000 device, and we're giving them to them in record numbers, right? Let's look and see. Some of you are going, What's, what are you asking? It seems that much some days, that's for sure. It seems like $800,000, doesn't it, some days? All right, 76, it's about social media. 76% of teens aged 13 to 17 use Instagram. 75% use Snapchat. By the way, that number is increasing. Snapchat is going to overtake more than likely Instagram, at least statistically speaking. Followed by 66% use Facebook. Though most students will tell you they have a Facebook account, but they rarely check it. They always are mostly on Snapchat and Instagram. And, of course, the number one, app is YouTube, by the way. That's where kids spend the bulk of their time, watching these awesome videos. Okay, I, I've yet to understand, and I guess I should have gotten in on the, on the mix here, that my child wants to watch, my youngest, she's not in here yet, next week, everybody hang on, she's going to be here next week. Uh, she loves to watch people play with toys on a video. Like, not play with her toys, watch somebody else play with toys on a video. That is so stupid. 
But she loves it. It's crazy. All right, let's just see. This is where our world is. Let's see what else. 57% of teenagers agree. <laughs> this is not our teenagers, of course. Right? Agree using social media distracts them from doing homework. Now, if I were to ask, and I won't, if I were to ask your boss if it ever distracts you from doing your work at work, this would be an interesting number to note. Let's check it out. Keep going. Um, most teens text with regularity, but 40% were using another social media app for messaging like Kick or WhatsApp or Line. Never heard of that one before. The average teenager sends over 60 texts a day. I saw another stat that said that the average teenager in a month sends over 3,000 in a month. That sounds more realistic. Some of you are nodding your head. All right? That's a lot of talking. It's a lot of talking on the text, right? 82% of teens, 72% of preteens, and 70% of parents confess to sleeping with their phones next to them at night. Okay? I told you it's going to hurt some of our feelings, right? Mine included, all right? Watch this, adults. When you got up this morning, how many was the first thing you did? This is just good confession this morning. You feel so much better when you leave. How many of you, the first thing you did within an hour of waking up, you checked this device? Raise your hand. In the first hour, you were awake. Look at this. Look around the room, folks. Keep your hands up just for a moment. Look around. See, don't you feel better? So cathartic to get it all out, just to confess. You're part of the norm. Okay? Right? Now, what are people doing on that? They're checking email. They're checking social media, right? Check this out, parents. Would you agree with this statement, parents? 78% of parents believe raising their kids is more complicated than it was when they were kids. 65%, the number one reason they say it's more complicated, is technology and social media. I know we hear it from our school system regularly of the challenge that social media brings. But it is a challenge. Let's look at the last one. I think there's one more maybe. Is that it? That's it. Now there are other stats we could talk about. But I want us to see that there's a lot of time and energy spent on these kinds of things. Now some of them again are good, right? Some of them have great value. Some of them add value to our lives. But there is this misnomer, this idea, especially among students and millennials in particular, that I am connected. I have a lot of friends, right? But our children have grown up and don't know what to do with boredom. There's always something to, uh, to take up the time and space in their life, right? So you've heard it in your family, and I have too. And I told my kiddos I was not going to embarrass them because they're that age when they're teenagers and they won't be talking about what we do in our house. But I'm going to talk a little bit about it, but in generalities. But, but you've ever heard this in your, in, your, in your car, maybe? We get to go somewhere, right? And I say the dreaded words, hey, let's put those devices down. Let's actually talk. And here's what I hear. But what are we going to do? Anybody ever heard that? Parents, anybody heard that of your kids? Okay. Oh, good, only four of you. The rest of you haven't. Okay, it's just my family. Hey, we're weird. All right, it's good to know, kids. All right, so here's the deal, right? Get to, get to the mealtime at a restaurant, right? What do, you, what do you see when you go? Look around when you go out to lunch today. I want you to do an experiment. Look around when you go to lunch today, if you have time to look up from your own device, okay? Look up, all right, and look at the people at a table and how little conversation takes place. It's this right here. Watch when you come in the building next Sunday morning. Just watch this. You come in the building Sunday morning and you see a lot of this right here. Right? We spend so much time. We think we have community and friends. But the reality is we are becoming more isolated than ever before. But here's the great news. The gospel has an answer for that and it's called the church. The church as God intended it for it to be, for us to have community together. We find that in our church we pray in life groups, in a smaller group than this, a setting a talk, to fellowship outside of that together, to know one another, to share life together, to do life together. So what do we do? There's four truths I want us to look at in Ephesians chapter 5 and then just give you some, some thoughts. And I want you to know too, there's two good resources I'm going to recommend you at the end and I've really contemplated and I still may do it of trying to give you a little bit more help, parents in particular, uh, and out of two resources, I don't, I'm not the end-all, be-all expert on social media, and I'm, I rely on my wife heavily because I don't understand 95% of it and how to look and see what they're doing. But um, uh, there's two great resources I want to recommend to you that will help you, I think, in a lot of ways as I've read through these books, but give you a specific plan that you can work together with your family 
on how to deal with this issue of social media and digital media, how much time we spend on it. I think the vast majority of us, if I were to ask this question, how many of you would agree, don't, don't raise your hand, but I think if I asked this, almost 100% of us would say, how many of us would agree we need to spend less time on this? I think most of us would nod our head and say, yes, absolutely. I don't think there's any question in our mind. So let's talk about why. God's word addresses this. Let's look in chapter 5, verse 15 one more time. Recognize these truths, all right? Number one, recognize the truth. Verse 15 says, we have to be careful how we walk. We have to be careful how we walk. The Bible says, the translation, the Phillips translation says it this way. Live life then with a due sense of responsibility. Not as men who do not know the meaning and purpose of life, but as those who do. We've got to be careful how we walk in our lives. Aware of how we live our lives. That how you live your life matters to God. What we do and how we spend our time, what we say, what we think, how we spend that precious and valuable resource that has become more valuable than money to most people, and that is time. We all want more of it. It matters how we live our lives of how we treat people. It matters the moral choices we make on a daily basis, how we spend our time, our energy, our resources, the friends that we make. Right, Because we know how to live this life if we're a follower of Christ, or we should, right? to know how to walk carefully in this world. And as a result, that's a, that's a testimony to a lost and dying world of how we live our lives. We know what the meaning of purpose lies is, so therefore, Paul says here, we should walk in the truth. Our lives should be different. And listen, I'm not calling you to be Amish this morning, okay? And to get rid of all your electronic devices, get rid of all of your TVs, that's not what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to re-examine and to think about how you're walking in your life. Are you walking with a sense of responsibility? Are you walking knowing that you have a meaning and a purpose in this world? How do we walk wise? How do we walk this way? The Bible says here to walk wisely and not unwisely. To walk wisely and not unwisely. You and I desperately need, especially as parents, teenagers, you need wisdom. We need wisdom desperately to know how to walk through this potential minefield of the world we live in. There are a lot of people, teenagers, listen to me carefully. Adults, there are a lot of people who walk unwisely in this area of social media. There are people, and it's not to scare anybody to death, but it ought to scare us to some extent. There are people who they use these things for predatorial behavior. They use them to track down innocent children and unsuspecting teenagers who don't know that people lie, that people do not reveal their identity correctly online and on social media and on games, on gaming platforms that you use, the Playstations and Xboxes and those kinds of things, right? So we have to, be, we have to walk wisely, parents. We have to think for our children because sometimes they're going to make unwise decisions, So we have to help them understand what wisdom is about and even make difficult and hard decisions and choices that may be even some other parents that you know don't make the same ones as you do. How do we walk wisely? Well, think about this. Proverbs talks about lots of great words about wisdom. The the Bible says there in Proverbs, a fool lives recklessly. The unwise flaunts his folly, hangs with fools and despises wisdom. That the Bible says the one who wants to walk in wisdom values it and pursues it diligently. James tells us if we are seeking or needing wisdom to ask the Lord and he'll give it. In Colossians, Jesus is remi- we're reminded that he is the treasure of all the wisdom that we need. And in Matthew's gospel, he talks about, about the foolish man and the wise man. And the wise man built his house on the rock and the foolish man built his house on the sand. My heart, if I'm just being honest, and I'm talking to all of us, not just to teenagers, to all of us. If we're not careful, we will build our lives on this, which is the sand. In so many ways, this represents our culture. And what they say our culture says is important and is valuable and is necessary. But that's unwise. We need to walk carefully. So recognize the truth. We need to walk carefully, wisely, not unwisely. The second truth is this. We must redeem the time. Redeem the time. One translation says the verse this way. Make the most of every minute because these are evil times. 
Another one says, make the most of every moment. Seize your opportunities. Another translation says, to redeem the time. That's the original Greek word of that word means to obviously to redeem, to deliver, or to buy back. In other words, to pull back from wasting something to make sure it has the best use of it. To not be enslaved to sinful pursuits, but to buy it back so that you can make the best use of it. So I'm not saying get rid of this. What I'm saying is let's redeem it. Right? Let's redeem it with the gospel. Let's redeem it for use that is good and right and what God would intend for it to be in your life and in mine. That it is not an idol. That it is not something that overtakes your life. That it is something that is not out of control. But instead, we want to redeem it this morning. The word time here, by the way, is not talking about hours and minutes. It's a different Greek word, right? The word kairos is the word it's mentioned here. It's talking about a season, an occasion, a period of time or an opportunity. In other words, that's the idea of making the best use of an opportunity. Your life and my life is filled with opportunities and seasons, periods of time. You and I do not get to do life twice. We don't get a do-over. We don't get a mulligan. We only get one shot at this life. When you think about that, it ought to make you take a deep breath or a gulp and say, wow, I need to let that truth in. Teenagers, you don't get a do-over to do your teenage life over again. You get one shot at it. That's it. Parents, we get one shot at parenting our teenagers and our children. We get one shot. There are no do-overs. So we have to think about how do we redeem the time. There's a guy in World War II. It's an interesting story of seizing opportunities. There was a young, attractive girl and her dignified grandmother were on a train crossing Europe during World War II. And onto the small compartment, the small compartment they were in, stepped a young, handsome corporal and his senior officer. They ended up passing through a tunnel, and as they passed through that tunnel, two distinct sounds were heard in the darkness. One was a kiss, and the second one was a slap. Thoughts raced through each of the four people's minds. The girl was flattered that the young captain would kiss her, and the proud of her, and the proud, uh, of her grandmother for slapping that brazen soldier who would dare try to kiss her. The grandmother was taken aback that the soldier would dare to kiss her, granddaughter, but quite proud of having her, of her for having the gumption to slap him. The commanding officer couldn't blame his young aide for kissing the girl, but was confused about why she slapped him. And the young soldier grinned from ear to ear and savored the joy of kissing a pretty girl and slapping his commanding officer at the same time. It's going to get to some of you in just a minute. Let's get there. He sees this opportunity, right? I want to tell you this morning, I pray that today for some of you, you would redeem the time. Teenagers, I'm praying for you that you would redeem the time. It will make you different, I know, than everybody else if you choose not to do certain things, if you choose to limit what you do. But I'm praying you will seize the opportunity God's given you and redeem the time to buy it back, if you will. We can't buy back time that has already gone by, but we can buy time ahead, if you will. Why do we need to do that? Because the days are evil. I don't think I have to tell you or convince you that the days in which we live in are evil. You saw it yesterday at Walmart in El Paso, Texas. We saw it earlier at another Walmart earlier in Tennessee. We see it all around us. The heartbreak and the evil that is all around us. These days are evil, friends. Time is of the essence. Time is short. We as believers, more than anyone else, should know that we need to redeem the time that God has given us. That we must be lights shining brightly in the darkness. In a place where Satan is out to steal and to kill and destroy your life. The flesh, your flesh is out to destroy you. This world, this world system, if you will, is out to destroy you and I. But the good news is this. We know the truth of the gospel. We know there is a way to redeem the time. There is a way to live in a way that's pleasing to the Lord. Notice the third truth. Resolve to track. Recognize the truth. Redeem the time. Thirdly, resolve to track. What do you mean? To know God's will. To know and follow God's will. The New Living Translation says this verse this way. Don't act faultlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. 
Again, the echo is back to verse 15, to not be foolish or unwise, but to pers- and to pursue what you want, what you think is best or right. But instead, we're called to seek the Lord, seek His will for your life and for the life of your family. Now, I know some of you, and I had this conversation from time to time, a student or even an adult will come and say, I just don't know what the will of God is for my life. And I mean, I'm talking about specifically, should I pursue this vocation? Should I take this job? Should I go this direction? Should we move here? Should we go there? But in generalities, listen, the will of God is not some cosmic hide and go seek. The will of God is clearly and abundantly spelled out in his word. Jesus told his disciples and told a Pharisee who came and asked him, Lord, could you sum up the whole Old Testament in one verse? And Jesus said, sure, I'd be glad to. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Most of us can quote that. We can make it a hashtag or pop it on social media today. But here's the real question. Do you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Or do you love, listen to me carefully, do you love this more? Now listen, I can say all day long, oh, I love the Bible. I'm a Christian. I love God's word. But we don't spend time in it. We don't spend time getting to know it. We spend time pursuing all kinds of other things. So do we really love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength? Are we really heeding the call, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you? Are you seeking him first? Am I hearing the call that Jesus gave his disciples to deny myself, to take up my cross daily and to follow him? You know what God's will is for your life? For you to have a loving relationship with him, to know him, to love him, to follow him, to serve him, to be in a relationship, to experience that relationship. I find myself sometimes we talk so much about it, we don't take enough time to actually experience it. And here's why we don't, because our faces are always in something if we're not careful. We don't take time to be quiet and be still before the Lord and experience that relationship. It affects our marriages. It affects our relationship with our children and our teenagers. And I pray this gives you stuff to talk about at lunch. I pray there's great conversations at lunch. I know some of our teenagers are going to love me, and I've warned my head of time. Your friends are not going to like me today, and that's okay, because you're going to, your, your parents, I pray, are going to have some conversation with you about that. And teenagers, can I give you a word? Teenagers, look right here, all right? Two things. Number one, I love you a ton. Number two, you can call your parents on the carpet too. Okay, fair enough? Okay, I don't really like that idea at all, but I'm going to let you do it, okay? Because if we're not careful, we do the same thing, right? Conversations. Notice, notice this. Uh, what's the last one? Release your control. Release your control. What does it say in verse 18? Be full of the Spirit, not of anything else. In particular, he says, don't be full of wine, don't be drunk. But the opposite of that is being filled with the Spirit. Now, what does that mean? Now, let me make a theological statement that's very important for you to know. The Southern Baptists, we believe very clearly that when we find Christ as Savior and Lord and we ask Him to our heart and He calls our name and we respond to that call, that we receive Christ as Savior and Lord, we believe we also receive the Holy Spirit in, its, in, its, in His entirety. We don't get like piecemeal. We don't believe in a second filling, if you will. We believe that we get it all of God at one time. Okay? So when we see a verse like this, we're like, what in the world does that mean? Be filled with the Spirit. I thought I already was. Right? It's more of an idea of being aware and recognizing the fact that you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. And that you make a conscious decision. Listen to me carefully. You make a conscious decision to say, Lord... I want you to fill me up. I don't want to be filled up with the stuff of the world. I don't want to be filled up with the stuff of me. I don't want to be filled up with the stuff of anything else. But Lord, would you fill me with your presence, with your joy, with your peace, with your wisdom, with your hope, with purpose. Fill me up to overflow so that as I walk throughout my days, that I can be a blessing to others as you are filling me in my life. See, really, when we do this, by the way, we're full of the Spirit of God, we'll make better decisions and choices about redeeming the time. We really will. If we're following God's will and we're seeking first His kingdom and we're loving with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and we're denying ourselves, taking up our cross and following Him, we'll be full of the Spirit. But it's a daily decision we have to make. And really, not only is it a daily decision, listen to me, it's really a moment-by-moment decision. 
Because I can make a decision at 7 o'clock in the morning and I don't know what's going to hit me at 10.30 and I need to make a fresh decision at 10.30 before going to that meeting with somebody that I want to knock their lights out or I want to tell them straight up what I really think or, I wanna, I want, or I'm in trouble or something happened. I've got to make a decision at that moment. Am I going to act on my wisdom or am I going to rely on the Spirit of God? See the difference? When we take these four truths into account, I think it helps us make wise decisions about how we deal with digital and social media in particular. How much time we spend watching the television, how much time we spend on YouTube, how much time we spend on the internet, how much time we spend on video games, right? Now, before Tina Gigo was talking to me, there are a lot of, a lot of millennials that love video games, right? Typically, my generation older, I can play a video game of one kind. It has a red joystick and a red button. Pac-Man, Galaga, right? I, I can't do the 40th of it. I get, makes me, I, mean, I throw up playing the games, like Fortnite and all that other stuff. I, can't, I mean, I've tried to play them. I just, I, my man just stares down at the ground the whole time, pretty much. I tried to play the Star Wars thing, and I'm like, I need to barf back. I'm going to throw up. I just can't, I can't even, I can't make my Gaga the right way. You're just spinning around, right? You know, I can't do that. But for some of you, that is something for you. You spend a lot of time gaming. Hours, days, into the night. Right? And the question is, is that the best and right use of the time that God has given you? Now we're saying moms and dads go home and unplug the PlayStation and Xbox and put it up on the shelf and never let them have it again. Absolutely not. That's not what I'm saying. I'm simply saying, are we willing to get in a conversation and have the conversation about what is a balance? That's a good word. Balance. Some closing thoughts as we end this morning. Recognize our, our, reason, our resources and our responsibility. Number one, recognize the good and the bad that technology and social media can bring. Let's just call it what it is. There is some good. Let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater, right? Well, sometimes we want to do that. I, I want to do that too, right? If I'm not careful, we can do that. There are some really good, helpful tools and resources that can be helpful to you and to me. Secondly, remember that this phone can be a weapon, right? Again, I, I, you could ask some folks that are in our school district. They would tell you that this right here is more powerful than any gun. This right here, and I'm talking about this being social media in particular, has caused people to take their lives. It has caused people harm. Folks, you got to be careful what you put on this thing. Because a lot of times it's there forever. Right? I know Snapchat tells you that it will delete itself. Right? Insta, Insta, Insta Snap. Is that what it's called? Insta Chat. Well, I know on the Instagram, there's no feature like that. It's on Snapchat. What is it called? A DM? No, it's not that. The one that disappears. On Instagram, can't you send something that disappears too? Like it does on Snapchat? Stories. Yeah, 24 hours disappears, right? Listen, I could, uh, I could bring my friend Alyssa, who is our police officer that takes care of us and, and um, gets us out on 42, blocks all the traffic, makes all the Methodists and other Baptists really mad, and uh, lets us out. So we wave at her and smile at her, by the way, when you go out today. If I were to bring her in here, she deals with sex crimes. That's her job. And the horror story she could tell you, and she'll tell you, you just think it disappears. It does not. It does not. I have a very close friend who is in a, works in a school system somewhere else. And a person applied for a job, hired him on the job, came to work at 8 o'clock, and by noon they fired him because they finally had, a, had, they had not had enough time to check his social media. And by the time they checked his social media, they fired him because of what was on it. Right? We've got to recognize that these things are weapons. There's pornography on it. We're not even touching that one. Folks, adults, just in case you don't know, I think the vast majority of you know that when you give this to your child with no filters, with no protection on it, they have access to the filth beyond imagination. Okay? Now, we're going to give you some resources on how to help you, help you with that. Secondly, recognize the amount of time you spend on it. Right? They got little awesome things here because everybody started complaining. People spend as much time on it. They got timers. They'll time you. You can look on a daily basis how much time you spend on this device. You ought to look. I challenge you to look every day and see what you're doing. Okay? 
Fourthly, let me challenge you. Reduce the amount of time you spend on technology and social media. And this is going to be, this is going to be revolutionary for some of you. This is going to be, I'm telling you. I challenge you. I dare you. I double dog dare you to take a fast from social media. A day a week. Take a week off. Three days. I know, teenagers, your life would end. I know if you took a month off. I know, so don't. What would happen if you just saw, what would my life be like for a day or two without it? Don't play that video game. Don't look at YouTube. And in that time you would have spent doing that, for some of us, (sighs) blow off the dust. And let me encourage you because it's a temptation. Though the Bible app is great, right? And some of you are on it. And it's always a struggle for us to, to put something on the Bible app for you because when you go on the Bible app, there's also 14 other things. And I like you sit in a meeting and hide my phone on my lap and check other things when I'm bored in the meeting. Y'all do that too, don't you? <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Come on, people. Y'all are just too stiff. Good grief, right? We know it happens. So what I would say is, and that's why I love it, is have a copy of God's Word. So I want you to bring it with you. I encourage you. I know you have it on your phone, but there's something, and maybe I'm old school, and that's fine if I am, but there's something really, really spectacular about touching the Word of God, underlining it, circling it, writing notes in it, having it jump off the page at you. And then you don't have the temptation of it on your device. Use that other times, all by all means. But the reading plan, you can just get the reading plan and then go read it in your regular old Bible. All of us have one in our house, Right? Reorder your priorities. If you're going to redeem the time, you have to reorder your priorities. Replace it with something else. All kinds of things. Refuse to cave to cultural and peer pressure. Don't resign yourself to the fact that, well, it just is what it is. I like to let my kids do it or I'm going to do it just because it is what it is. Resist the temptation, moms and dads, for your kid to fit in so badly that you'll go against your convictions. Now, every parent's going to have different convictions, Right? Every parent's going to have a different age, a time where they want to give a child a device, when they get on social media, whatever it is, I understand that. So I'm not making that judgment call. That's not my place, right? That someone say, well, how old should they be, pastor? That's not my place to call. Now, I have thoughts about it, right? I have thoughts about it. And you put that on vibrate. That's nice. Social media, that's really funny what that was. But anyway, <laughs> let me, that, that was none of you, by the way. That was somebody else. Um, but... Don't take me a second to get back on my track of thought. Oh, there it was. It's going to be different for everybody. But you have to make a decision to not make your decision based off what other people are doing, based off what you believe is right for your family, based on the Word of God for you. Okay? Resolve to have a family plan. Okay? I want to challenge you today or tonight, maybe this week, You would sit down as a family and develop a plan for how you'll use technology. For example, things like you might make in your plan. Hey, when we come to eat supper, okay, lunch, whenever it is you're eating together, electronic devices, television, whatever it is, it goes off. It pauses. We put, and we don't even bring it to the table. Unless it's an emergency or something's going on, you have to have it, right? Somebody work or whatever. I can remember in my life, back in the day before we had technology, back in the 70s, my dad would come home at supper time at 5 till 6. Everybody's rear end was at the table at 6. No questions asked. You better be there. And my mom, I can still remember, you remember these old things called landlines? You remember the phone cords that were like 45 feet that you could walk into the room with and hide from your parents so you couldn't hear your conversation? So she would take that phone. There was a cabinet right behind her table. She would put it in there. I can still hear that. Some of y'all never heard this, what this even sounds like. Y'all never even heard what a busy signal sounds like. It was like this. And it would go off for two minutes before it stopped. Mama would take the phone off the hook so that nobody could call us and interrupt our family time at supper. Okay? So some of us need to make some active choices like that. And I know some of you teenagers are going to die and have a heart attack, but you'll survive. I promise. Right? Mine die when it's lunchtime. The only exception we typically make in our house typically is for Saturday nights in the fall. Because it's football time almost. Right? Other than that, we try. We don't always do it, but we try. We're not perfect. Um, What else? Um, When you're in the car, sometimes we're missing conversation moments with our kids. Now, is it easier just to stick them in front of something to shut them up, especially if they're younger? 
Someone said, yes, yes, it is. It is. I've done it. But let us resist that temptation. Come up with a family plan that works for you, okay, and your family. The amount of time you spend on video games or phones or gamings. In our house, we, we decide, hey, here's, here's, a, here's a time limit what we're going to give you. On occasion, we'll give you more time, okay? But by and large, this is what we're going to do to limit it. Because if not, all of us will spend an unlimited amount of time doing it. We just will. We're, we're wired that way, right? There are filters that you can use. There are apps that will help you monitor uh, what your kids are doing and what's happening in their lives. Not to spy on them, okay, but to help them create boundaries, right? All of us now need to create a plan. So if you decide that you're not going to give your child the Insta- Instagram or Snapchat at 12, which if I could speak a word into that, if you would ask me, thank you for asking, put off social media as long as you possibly can for your child. I promise you it is for their well-being. You, you go talk to expert after expert, and they're going to tell you. I could line them up in here of all kinds of different people. They will say, put it off, put it off, put it off. And then when you do get it, you have a plan of how you're going to use that. And then you got to come up with a plan of how you're going to graduate them into their own thing, right? Right? And that's where, that's where we are in our house, right? Some of you already passed all this, but that's where we are in our house. You got to come up with a plan of how I'm going to how I'm going to graduate them to help them have boundaries in their own right to know what to use and how to use it. But you got to have a plan. You can't just do it ahead of time. I remember you speaker used to always tell us back in the day, the time to decide how far you're going to go on a date is not in the back seat of a car in the heat of the moment. That's the worst time to decide it. The time to decide it is way before that point. The same is true for technology. So that your kids know what it looks like and what it's going to be like for your house. Right? The last couple. Realize there are apps, internet accountability, filters, etc. that you can use. There's two sheets on the, uh, out there in the foyer you can grab. We did a technology uh, summit three years ago. Three years ago, Chris. And probably all this is probably obsolete in some ways by then because it changes so quickly. Um, Chris and I talked about this when we do our family series. We're probably going to offer another opportunity to do another technology summit. I don't know Jack Dilly Squad about technology hardly, other than I don't know how to turn my phone off and on and reboot it. I can do that. But other than that, I'm not too smart. Chris is brilliant with it. He knows a lot of stuff. Charlie Morgan has helped us before. We'll offer another summit to give you some ideas and helps, okay, on these kind of things. Remind your students regularly about the responsibility that comes with technology. Students, listen to me carefully. I know your parents have told me. Let me, let me echo what your parents have told you. Your reputation will stay with you the rest of your life. If I line up job employers... If I lined up Dr. Dillon with our school system, I lined up some of you that have businesses in town. And if I lined you up, one of the very first things they're going to do, though one of the very first things they're going to do before they, they interview you, they're going to look at your social media. And a lot of us, because you've, you've had it a long time, for some of us, you know, I got on Facebook, you know, 10 years ago, whatever it was, right? I don't have that long of a history. But some of you, by the time you get a job, you're going to have 20 years or 15 years of social media. Right? Unless you think that it's just on your page and you delete it, guess what happens? Right? Y'all know what happens, right? What happens? Screenshots, right? Screenshots. You can take a picture of the screen on your phone or on your electronic device and it's there forever and it can be shared on the web. And once it goes on the web, it's almost impossible for it to go away. We've talked to missionaries who have gone to, to, have gone to uh, closed countries. And they were on church websites and they were in other places. They need to get their name off of the internet because when you go into a foreign country, guess what they do? You fly for a visa, they look at your social media. They look for your name on Google. Freak yourself out, go Google yourself today. Especially if you're an adult. It'll flabbergast you what's out there. Right? And so you've got to be careful. What you do now will have a huge effect on what you do later. Adults, last two, and I'm three, I promise. Represent what it means to use technology appropriately. Okay? We can't expect our kids to do something we're not going to do first. So, how? listen, watch this now. How we interact on social media, what we say on social media, is important because they're going to see what you say. And they'll learn, just like they learn in other areas of life, how to interact. You all know that people feel very emboldened Right? Those that are in leadership know this. We've experienced it. I've had my, I have been ripped. I mean, I have been ripped on social media. Some of you have been as well. For people who have never said that kind of stuff to my face, ever. We have to be so careful that we model it 
to our children, that we teach them to our students that you are not invisible. You are not free to say whatever the heck comes into your mind and blab it on the social media. Why? Because we represent Jesus and everything that you say represents who you are. And then lastly, renew your walk with the Lord. Right? Some of us just need to renew our walk. We think about redeeming the time. We think about going back and looking. Am I walking carefully as wise or unwise? These are some great truths. I pray these will be jumping boards for you to have conversations as a family, as couples, moms and dads together to have conversations with your kids, your teenagers, maybe to make some serious adjustments to what you are doing. I encourage you to do that. Some of you are already on track and you're good, but I want to encourage you. Moms and dads, you're not alone if you make these kind of decisions. And your kids are going to tell you the phrase that we used to tell our parents, right? But everybody else has it and everybody else is on it and everybody else is everybody, everybody, everybody. Don't buy into that lie. Be willing to stand your ground if God calls you as your family what you need to do. Two books here. I just want to mention them. The TechWise Family. Uh, Everyday Steps for Putting Technology in Its Place by Andy Crouch. Written in 2017, so it's a very relevant, recent book. And Every Parent's Guide to Navigating Our Digital World by Kara Powell and her bunch. I don't always agree with everything she says necessarily, but it's good. It offers you conversation pieces with your teenagers. In particular, this is a book focused mostly for students. Uh, if you have teenagers in your house of how to have these kind of conversations, good to resource. I encourage you, if you want to, I, we didn't order them. I don't get any money off it. I'm just telling you, these are resources that I looked at and that I will probably use later on to help us think through how do we make these kind of adjustments. Redeem the time. Redeem the time. Let's pray together. Father, I...